University of Wyoming. Mike has a bachelor's from Oxford, a master's from Cornell, and a PhD from Cambridge. He has wide-ranging research interests, uh, and from his website he says that he is a process-oriented earth scientist who believes in a multidisciplinary approach to solving problems. I heartily endorse that. His primary research aim is to better understand how the Earth's crust grows and evolves. His research philosophy is to combine field work with laboratory-based studies and mathematical-based studies. And he strives whenever possible, and I heartily endorse this, to go to the best possible location in the world to do this work. <laughs> Following these principles, in particular that last one, he has worked on projects in Antarctica, Scotland, South Africa, the US, <coughs> Ireland, France, and Zimbabwe, Canada, as well as had, having the opportunity to study the oceanic crust in the Pacific, the Indian, the Atlantic Oceans, and the Caribbean Sea. So, and Mike uh, asked that uh, I mention that his primary focus these days is actually on the oceanic crust. We'll mention something about that, I think, at the end of his presentation here this evening. Um, his publication list is, let's just leave it at long and varied. He has a regular stable of graduate students, what uh, good research scientist doesn't, to work with him on his projects and who he has sent onward to their own uh, earth science careers uh, around the U.S. and beyond. So without further ado, um, I, no, I, there's one other thing I need to do. I need to point out that his spouse, Barbara John, Bobby John is sitting at the back, and Bobby gave us a talk here about a year and a half ago, so I want to recognize Bobby as well. So Bobby, would you stand up for just real quick so people can see who you are? <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to our speaker this evening, Mike Cheadle. Thank you, everybody. I mean, thank you for inviting me. It's been fun to come up here. We're going to spend a couple of days up here. I'm looking forward to it. And Bobby's strategically placed at the back. And I see him doing that. It means shut up and get going. Well. So, <laughs> so um, thank you for the intro, John. Um, I know there's some much more eminent people in the audience than I. Um, what I'm really going to try and do, do today to tell you about my trip to the Antarctic. I've only been once. And the talk's going to be a combination of a bit of science um, a bit of fun, hopefully, and a little bit of what it's like to work down there, and so on and so forth. Um, and so the first question that really comes up is, how did I get to go? And essentially, I was phoned up by a colleague. And so there I was on the phone, and, and they said, do you want to go to Antarctica? I said, well, that sounds a good idea. And they said, well, you know it's cold. And I said, well, I live in Laramie. And they said, well, you know it's high. And I said, well, I live in Laramie. And they said, well, you know, it's really windy. And I said, oh, come on, I live in Laramie. <laughs> and so, you know, to just show you that, here's the temperature record. So Bobby was at home, and in black is the temperature where I was working. And in was in Laramie. So, oops, the backs get used to using this thing. So, you know, right about here, I was on the satellite phone of Bobby saying, well, it's about to kill the sun's out, and it's zero degrees C, and she's got it's minus 25 here. You know, shut up. And the lights froze. <laughs> so, as, you know, as a background to that, and there are Antarctic experts in the audience, we were fortunate in that we were basically in, almost in the middle of the continent. We weren't on the plateau, and we weren't on the coast, and those are the areas where you get the real bad weather. And so the very last thing I'll show you is some bad weather. But this just gives you an idea of, you know, what the weather was typically like. And so to talk, start the talk, I'm going to talk about the geology of, of where we were working. And this is this thing, it's called the Dufet Complex. And this is a big mountain range, it's about 1,800 meters high. And I kind of took this picture as we were flying in for the first time by the plane, and we flew around here and landed over the other side. And arguably, this is the second biggest layered mafic intrusion frozen magma chamber in the world. And we'll come back to that in a moment. And we'll come back to why you know, I want to look at this thing. Before I go any further, I should mention the people I worked with. There were five of us that went down there. Um, Jeff Gee actually is the architect of a lot of what I'm going to talk about. He's the paleomagnetist. And a lot of the story I'm going to tell you today is the paleomagnetism story, which is the fun story. The other part of the story is the petrology, which is what I do. And to go down there, as some of you know, you have to take a mountaineer. Brian was a mountaineer from Alaska that looked after us. 
Bill now is at Exxon. He was a petrologist, and these were a couple of students that went. And there's the team standing outside one of our buses. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about how we get down there um, as we go along. <coughs> so where were we, and where is this, this intrusion? This is the other half of that picture I showed you earlier. So imagine us for the very first time flying in along here, me hanging out the window, taking all these photos. Here's where it is in the Pensacola Mountains in, in, in Antarctica. And here's some estimates of how big it is. And of course, the deal is, is Antarctica is mostly covered by snow, as you can see here. And so you have to do geophysics to look at how big this thing is. If you look over here, you can see the, the blue areas. These are the two exposed mountain ranges. I said they're both about 1,800 meters high. The beauty is there's no vegeta vegetation, so it's good for geologists. You can get full access to the rocks. But the two exposures of these things in blue, and then from magnetic surveying, people have argued it's either as big as the big blue area, which is what makes it the second biggest in the world, if you believe that. And that gives you an area of about 50,000 square kilometers. And other people, some Brits, came along and said, no, we don't need that. It's much smaller. It's this black area in here. But it still comes down to a sizable amount. And you know, just to give you a feel for that, if we look at the next bit, oh, sorry. So the next slide is, well, what is that thing? Well, it's a, a, an intrusion. And the way of thinking about it is it's the guts of the volcano. So this is one of the biggest magma chambers that feed volcanoes that probably ever existed or that we know existed on the Earth. And these things, you know, we can find them in the fossil record. You know, they aren't active today. And part of the fun is trying to figure out how they work. And so the slide I was going to go, because I changed things around just before the talk, is you know, get a feeling for how big it is. Here's where we are. Remember those, those two estimates, the small estimate. Well, the small estimate basically makes you know, the, the aerial extent of the magma chamber the size of the whole of Yellowstone. If you believe that bigger one, then it's that big. And so that was some, a seven kilometer thick lens of magma that sat there feeding volcanoes um, 180 million years ago. And in fact, just put it into context, so it says over there the biggest one in the world is the Bushveld complex in um, South Africa, and that would be about that big. That one is is much older, it's about two billion years old. You know, part of the fun of these things is trying to understand how they work. And you know, because we haven't seen them, we can't go and observe them today, we still argue endlessly for how they work. Okay, how did it form? Um, here it is. Um, you can see this kind of, it should be green, but there's this little blob in here. This is basically um, the breaking apart of Antarctica, Africa, India, and so on and so forth. And actually this debate of how it actually formed, but it formed during the early stages of rifting in Antarctica. And the, you know, the argument is, is it part of the rifting? Is it excess magmatism when we first pull you know, the Atlantic Ocean apart um, and the Indian Ocean? Here's the Atlantic Ocean forming. Here's the Indian Ocean. Or actually, was it prior to that in a subducting environment? We'll see it again. Here's the subduction zone. Here it is. And you can see the time scale up here. So if it's 180 million years old, it actually formed perhaps due to the subduction of the Pacific Plate along this margin. It's a little bit earlier than this rift. But again, it's one of the questions we don't really know. In the literature, it tends to get put together with the rifting, um, but it's just a little bit earlier. Okay. So what were the objectives of the project? Twofold. To determine the strength and direction of the Earth's magnetic field in the Jurassic about 180 million years ago. And I'll explain why that's important in a minute. And then to better understand why and and how the Earth's magnetic field reverses. Many of you know that the Earth's magnetic field reverses every now and again. We haven't seen it in our lifetime happen. Question is, how long does it take to do that? What happens to the Earth's magnetic field when it does that? These are questions we don't know, but maybe we can get some answers by looking at the work record. And the other part of the story, which is really my work, is to determine the magmatic and thermal history of the intrusion. You know, how do these big magma chambers really work? I just made the case it's the second biggest in the world. How does that actually work? And that's the kind of stuff I'm going to talk about today. You can say to me, why is this important? Well, here's some you know, relatively recent work by Olson 2010. What this picture is showing you is temperature at the core mantle band. So in these pictures, this yellow area represents high temperatures. And on these pictures, we're showing the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. And so the point that this picture is trying to show you, and this is just modeling, 
is that when we have a strong field, which means, you know, in this case, you can see the South Pole is firmly fixed in one location, we actually have a relatively, you know, average temperature across the core mantle boundary. As we go to weaker magnetic fields, and the prediction is we'll have much more temperature variation at the core mantle boundary. And so the point is, by studying things like the Earth's magnetic field, it's not only just telling us about the field, it's telling us about the thermal history of the Earth, um, you know, and, and what's actually going on at the um, cross mantle boundary. And that's one of the reasons, again, for this kind of study. So, let's introduce that. Those of you that might have read the little blurb that I wrote, and got kind of uh, changed a little bit. Um, but let's talk about the Earth's magnetic field. And, you know, many of you know all this stuff, but let's just examine that before we start. Here's a standard picture that everybody knows. Here's the Earth. And we can kind of think of the Earth's magnetic field as the field you'd expect around a bar magnet if it was put at the center of the Earth. In other words, we have a North Pole, we have a South Pole, and these are the magnetic field lines. Um, it's not a bar magnet at the center of the Earth. It's more complicated than that, as I'll show you. But the bar magnet is a great analogy for understanding the shape of the field. The field is actually created within the core, and so here's a picture of the Earth, here's the core just here, and here's the modeling that we'll see in a minute. And this is actually a picture of the core. And what you're seeing there, this, this yellow area, is actually the, the kind of shape of the rotating components of the fluid in the core, and that's what's generating the Earth's magnetic field. It's called a geodyne, which I'm sure some of you know. So let's think about that field. And here's the kind of picture, this is actually from NASA, so I'm going to kind of drift over into sensationalism for a minute. But this is from NASA. Here's our sun. And so based on the sun, we've got cosmic radiation hitting us. In some ways, the Earth's magnetic field is protecting us from that um, solar radiation. And that's what this picture is trying to show you here. You know, this is called the Earth's magnetosphere. Because these things are charged particles, because it's a magnetic field, the magnetic field is basically funneling these particles towards the north and south poles. And that's the cause of things like the aurora borealis, as you know. And so one of the pe things that people have speculated upon is what will happen if the field goes away? And what will happen, and will the field go away when it flips? I mean, the field is not going to go away in our grandkids, grandkids, grandkids lifetime, but it could possibly flip. And so when it flips, could it go away? And that's one of the consequences of that, and that's what we're kind of trying to watch. Now, I mentioned sensationalism, so let's see what Hollywood said about these things. You've probably seen this movie. I show this movie in my, we do a Hollywood science and fiction, science factual fiction class. I always show this movie, I love this movie. And so if we go to it and if things work, let's let, let me have a rest for a couple of minutes and see what the Hollywood scientists say that's going to happen. Well, that's understandable. The field becomes more and more unstable. We'll start seeing isolated incidents. One plane will fall from the sky, and then two, and then in a few months, anything, everything electronic will be fried. Static discharges in the atmosphere will create superstorms with hundreds of lightning strikes per square mile. After that, it gets bad. <laughs> the Earth's EM field shields us from the solar winds, which are a lethal blend of radioactive particles and microwaves. When that shield collapses, microwave radiation will literally cook our planet. This is the bit I love to show the Dr. students. <clears throat> this is the sun. This is the Earth without the EM field. Three months, gentlemen, and we're back in the Stone Age. A full year, the field collapses. Starting a planet. This is a. Alright, that's good enough. Are you going to watch more than once again? Ah, I love that. Seven miles with a two inch drill bit. If we can go into space, we search. Space is easy, it's empty. We're talking about millions of pounds of pressure per square inch. Even if we somehow came up with a brilliant plan to fix the core, we just can't get there. Yes, but.
polemică. So this reflects 
on what's happening in the center of the earth, what's happening in the core. And these were some of the things we were trying to investigate. Remember I mentioned the defect intrusion is 180 million years old, so we're off here. One of the reasons for being down there is ocean crust stops at about 160, so to get records beyond there, you have to go to places like the defect intrusion. But, okay, how and why does the field reverse, and how long does it take? And the truth is, we don't really know. Probably, how long does it take, as a guess, 100 years, 200 years? We don't know. We know it's going to happen, but we don't know, you know how long it's going to take, and we don't really know what is exactly going to happen. But there's some, people, some very clever people, Glaxemeyer, who have actually tried to predict it by model, try and mimic what actually happens. And so here's a picture of the Earth, and here's our magnetic field lines, kind of what it's like today, North Pole, South Pole. And so we can look at a series of pictures to show what might happen from the modeling when the field reverses. And so what you're looking at now is this is the core. So the Earth itself would be much bigger than this. Here's all the tangled field lines within the liquid core as the liquid, as the outer core is swirling around the inner core. And then this is what creates the nice field lines that we actually measure as it were as we walk around the surface of the Earth. So here's what it is today. In his models, this is what starts to happen just before a reversal. And you can see it's kind of unraveling. And you can see what the predictions are. Is suddenly you've got a South Pole and North Pole, and you're starting to get another little South Pole coming out of the equator, and so on and so forth. And in fact, that's what they predict. So here it is during a reversal. North and South Pole have broken down. We've now got three poles. They're like This was our original South Pole, which is now kind of up here. And then we've got two North Poles, if you like, one in the South, one up here. So something like this is what we think happens. And when that happens as well, the strength of the field probably goes down. And remember, coming back to our friend, the uh, um, uh, solar radiation, it's going to get funneled down wherever these things are. That's where the field is going to take it. So, you know, atmosphere is going to protect us. So the core, you know, is just a pure piece of Hollywood fantasy. But there are going to be consequences. Uh, communications. I mean, we're going to be living in a time where solar storms are things that really do affect us. And then afterwards, we start to come back to stability. We flip. You know, this greener stuff up here is now at the top. And then if we go one more, actually, let's see if I can keep my luck with the videos. Let's watch an animation of those pictures. Here it is, stable. And there it is, starting to flip. And you can watch it. And there it goes. And then it will stabilize out the other side. As I said, we can model it, we think, but it doesn't really help with the truth time scale. And so the only reason, way to nail this, other than to wait for it to happen, and it will happen, is trying to look at the rocks to see what they tell us about how this happens and, and uh, you know, how long it will take. So, let's try and test this using rocks. And so why the Dufek intrusion? Why go to this big old frozen magma body in um, in Antarctica, well, as I mentioned, it's 180 million years old, and then we'll see this on the next slide. It actually formed during a period of rapid field reversals and low-intensity field. Point is, if you're going to study the field reversals, you want to actually go somewhere where you can see a lot of them. It would be pointless doing it in the Cretaceous because there aren't any. So let's go to somewhere where we know you can see a lot of these things, and it's so big but it probably represents 100 million years of Earth's history. So maybe we can see 100 million years of these reverses. <coughs> and so those were two of the reasons we went there. Third reason is it's cooling slow enough that maybe you can actually record all these reversals and record the details of what happens when it reverses. Now, I mentioned that it was during a time of rapid re uh, reversals. Here's a couple of graphs which are you know, real data. So this is the frequency of magnetic reversals versus time. And so scales along here, this is 200 million years. This graph goes to 300 million years. So 300 million years along there. Here we are present day. We're seeing basically on the order of three reversals every million years. Go back to the Cretaceous. Remember, in the Cretaceous, no reversals. And then lots of reversals again. Here where we are is where we are with the dufex, been dated using zircons. 180 million years ago, period of relatively rapid reversals, and then declining as we go in the past. This part of the graph we know less and less about. Remember, you 
know, best record goes to about 160 million years, which is this graph down here. What this graph is showing you is a much more difficult thing to measure. This is the intensity of the magnetic field through time. And what it's trying to show you, and people speculate this, is that there's almost an inverse relationship. When the field isn't reversing, then the field strength is strong. And so the idea of this plot is you've got some very high values in here during the Cretaceous. Strong field equals no reversals. Lots of reversals equals weak field. And that's kind of the hypothesis out there, and that's one of the things we would try and test. You know, if we go to the DUFEC, we can measure the number of reversals, hopefully. We can also measure the field strength. So that's one of the kind of straw men that people have put out there that we can test. All right, let's leave the science for a minute. Some of you asked about Antarctica. How did you get to go to Antarctica for fun? I said, I'm not an expert. I've been once, so this was you know, a blast for me. First thing you do is you fly to New Zealand and Christchurch. Then you get on one of these things, a galaxy, and it takes you to McMurdo Base. And McBurdo, here's McMurdo Base today. Um, and it's actually one of the places where Scott was at. So these are some of Scott's ships. And I, you know, I personally like this kind of thing. You see it's exactly the same mountains in the background. <coughs> Scott was here basically 100 years before we are. Now, this is the US Antarctic Base. Um, and that's where you will go to start with. And then they put you in a C-130. And you get to go to the South Pole, which is kind of cool for free. Um, so here's the South Pole. Um, this is no longer the South Pole, of course, because the ice is moving. This is where the state was put in um, uh, when actually they both built South, South Pole Station. So this was built, put in about 50 years ago. But the ice is flowing, and so uh, the real South Pole is now some ways off. Um, here's what South Pole Station now looks like. Um, originally, they built a dome. They built a dome big dome, very spectacular base that was built in the 50s, but essentially you know, tend to get covered with snow, and then somebody had the bright idea, well, let's put everything on stilts, and then the snow just blows underneath. So now people live in these, these boxes on stilts. They're all connected on the corridor behind that picture. And then this is us in the C-130, luxury accommodation, you know, resting out before our big adventure. But um, the South Pole is not where we want it to be, we need to go to the Dufek intrusion down here. Here's our campsite. And how did they take us where the DC-3 built, built in the 1940s? Which was a blast. Re-engine, got a new engine, but the airframe is from the 1940s. It took three, three loads, um, three flights to bring us in. We had um, three snowmobiles. To collect the rocks, we were actually drilling. So what we actually needed was gallons and gallons and gallons of glycol, which is basically sugared water, to help lubricate the drilling without any impact on the environment. And so this was our base, that was the cook tent, that was our tent, um, and so on and so forth, that was the latrine. Um, and that's what it looked like. We, we were just camping here, and this was our view every day of the, the defect mountains. Now, I mentioned the plane in the 1940s. The year afterwards, that happened, unfortunately. Every, nobody was seriously hurt, but it just you know shows you. This was, this was the only plane they, they, they um, the U.S. Antarctic program subcontracts um, to, to a private company to fly you around. Um, in the good old days, they'd fly you around by C-130, but the Air National Guard you know, planned too many C-130s, so you get fly, flown around by a private corporation. This is the biggest plane they had, and that was the important so It was the only thing that could ship in all our gear. But one year afterwards, unfortunately, that happened to them. So, the Dufek, now we're in Antarctica. Here's the intrusion. And here's this, 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 this cliff face, if you like. This is 1.8 kilometers high. And we were working here, you know, slowly crawling up this thing, drilling holes. We took about 800 samples down here, and the equivalent of about 200 samples up here. So we cheated, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but basically, here's the stratigraphy, stratigraphy of the whole intrusion. Two ranges. They said the Dufek range, which is about 1.8 kilometers, and a big snow field. And then the forestal range, which is further away, and we didn't go there. And so we sampled, we drilled these little cores, because they have to be accurately oriented. If we're going to pull out the Earth's magnetic field, we have to know the orientation of the rock. And so they were all oriented with a sun compass. Can't use a magnetic compass because you're too close to the South Pole sun compass. So we took about 600 samples down here and a couple uh, of hundred samples up here, and that's what we did. Um, I said we cheated. Here's the geological map. 
Um, the intrusion or the outcrop of the intrusion is in yellow, all the blue is, is ice basically. Um, at the bottom, and we'll look at some rock pictures in a minute, there's an anorthosite, the Walker Peak anorthosite, and then basically gabbros, 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 gabbros. These things, these wiggly lines in here, are actually pyroxenites. There's some beautiful 80% you know, pyroxene rocks. You can see them in that previous picture. Here's one of them. This is the Neuberg peroxide. Here's another one. This is the Frost peroxide. These are the marker horizons. But what they show you is, is the nature of the beast, if you like. You can see the scale here. This is 10 kilometers. So this bit of the range is, and you can judge it better than me from this angle, you know, something like 50 or 60 kilometers long. The stratigraphy in that intrusion is just constant for 50 kilometers. You know, you could sample over here, and basically getting exactly the same rocks 50 kilometers away. And that's how we cheated with the height. In other words, you know, we, we walked up here, but by using both faults, these are faults, we could sample higher in the section without climbing the full one minute kilometers. Um, so we had five sections. You see these little black bars here, collecting all those rocks, putting them together in some sort of sequence. And here's, you know, again, just another picture on a more cloudy day. As I said, we basically sampled all the way up to here. And here's just, I mean, just shows you we took 610 samples on this section. And all this is is just an estimate of the modal mineralogy, how much plastic is in these rocks. Just kind of shows you the data that we've got. Average spacing is about one meter apart. And that's all that's really there for. Some rock pictures. Here's the Walker and North North site. For this sort of intrusion, it really is remarkably boring. Um, you know, it's just, it's beautiful layered intrusion with lots of layered. This sort of soft sediment deformation or slumping was very rare. We saw this in a few places. But in most cases, you've got relatively boring rocks. Here was our hero, Brian, I mentioned earlier. He was our mountaineer. He became our driller. So here he is with a rock drill, which is basically a chainsaw with a drill on the end. And so you can imagine, he came in, he started to have fun. He was such a big guy, he would just drill this thing at absolutely any angle he could, trying to make the paleo magician have a tough time trying to measure the orientation of the sun compass. So, you know, he had some fun. And then this is the next unit above. This is the Agenbau Gabbro. Um, and what it's marked by is this, this big um, peroxonite that I mentioned. This is the Neuberg peroxonite. Here's a close up of the bottom of the contact, the person in there for scale, and there for scale. So this thing, you know, you come out through Gabros, you get this kind of two meter layer of anorthosite, and then sharp as a knife, it basically turns into this peroxide. And one of the clues for perhaps what's going on, this is a big zenolith. And so you've got these country rock zenoliths. Some of these zenoliths are the size of a car, around about the stratigraphic level. And so our best guess is they represent some sort of magmatic replenishment into this um, magma chamber, that a big new volume of magma comes in, bringing pieces of country rock, and that explains some of the changes in chemistry. And here's another one of these contacts, pyroxene rich above, less pyroxene rich below. And this is us working, you know, taking these samples and trying to describe the rock. <coughs> so what have we learned? Well, this picture is just a straw man. It just shows you all the data we've got. You know, we mentioned 600 samples. Each core gets caught, cut into five pieces. We do lots of measurements to try and get the statistics down. We can measure the paleo declination. Remember the declination is how far off north it is. We can measure the paleo inclination, which tells us the orientation of the field. We can look at the strength of the field. We can look at how susceptible the rocks are to magnetism. To magnetism. We can look at the anisotropy. The idea is to collect all this kind of data and then invert it and tell us something about what's going on. And so the first question was, we talked about the magnetic field reversals. How many did we actually see? And so here's our stratigraphy. So at the bottom, towards the top, this, if you like, is our 600 samples. And what you're looking at here is just different temperature slices. So this is high temperature, this is intermediate temperature, this is low temperature. If you look at the bottom here, you can see normal reverse, normal reverse, normal reverse. We're just measuring in those pieces of rock, basically, which way the field is pointing. So in the Walker and Walther site, you can only see one component. You can only see a normal component. You see all these dots here? There's no data over here. As you move up this section, so we're now into this part of the Adam and Mount Gabbro, we can see the field is reversed, because now it's showing you the reverse component. And this is the high temperature. So we're watching, we're demagnetizing these rocks as they cool down. So we're going from high temperature, and then as we go to lower temperatures, the field is flipped within those rocks. And so we can see two components reversed to normal. 
And as you go to the top of this section, what you're actually seeing is you're seeing these ones first, so you're seeing a reverse component. Then, just about within that temperature range, it's flipping to a normal component, which is why it's over here too. And then as it cools down even further, you're getting back to a reverse component. So these rocks are showing three components. So we see you know, reversals, evidence for reversals, actually in the rocks. And you say to yourself, all right, what, what, what are you going to do with that? Well, here's just some modeling to show you what potentially we can back out of that data. So here's temperature, and these curves just represent the intrusion cooling down at different cooling rates. So here it is cooling really quickly, and here it is cooling much more slowly. It's just time on this mm -hmm. axis. And this zigzag is basically representing the field reversal. And so the point is, if it cools really quickly, then we don't see so many reversals. You know, the cooling history doesn't cross so many lines. Um, and actually, they'd be wider because um, you know, the, amount of, the relative amount of time in each one would be longer. And so we're using this graph to predict these graphs, which are much more <coughs> similar to the plots we're getting from the data. So here's stratigraphic height. Here's the temperature at which the reversal is occurring. And so the point is, you're seeing really, really slow um, cooling, then we'd expect to see lots of reversals in the rocks. So as you're in the lab, as we heat up the rock and cool it down, we'd expect to see a record of each flip after you know, one after another. If it's fast cooling, then in the rocks we're going to see these thick stripes and we won't see many of these. So the, the, you know, the corollary to that is this is what we can measure in the lab. From what we measure in the lab, then we can hopefully back out this, which is what you want to know, which is how frequently are things reversing and what are the cooling points. We call this barber pole diagram. And so to show you the data, because the truth is simple, here's the plot that corresponds most closely to these plots that we just had here. And again, apologies, we're not showing red today, um, but all this, this, this black stuff is red. And so this is just the real data. So each one of these you know, horizontal lines in here represents an experiment, a, a lab experiment on a rock. And so we're basically seeing, you see over here, it's labeled as reverse. The black is the reverse field, then the rock is showing you the normal field, and so on and so forth. And so down here, just as we saw earlier, these rocks only show a reverse field. These ones in here show um, uh, reverse to normal. And then up here, and you can't quite see it because the color's washed out, but we're actually seeing reverse to normal. And you can just see these things are gray, they should be red. You can just see that third component, so reverse, normal, reverse. And so that's what we're seeing. And so the trick is, you know, it's, this is the real world, is how does that picture relate to these, you know, model predictions like so. And those are the kind of games that we're trying to play. And, you know, and our best guess, and, you know, is that maybe this, this gray hair area in here is connecting through with the gray area over here. And then this is another gray area. This isn't the same as this one. And so we're seeing, you know, this sort of pattern of, you know, the diagonal stripe through the picture. But that's what we're basically trying to do. Um, another constraint is, you know, from those graphs, going back to it, an important point is, do we know the cooling history? And we can try and do that in two ways. We can try and do geochronology or thermochronology, date actually different minerals which cool to different temperatures, and we're trying to get NSF to funders to go back and do that. Or you can basically try to do some modeling again and so you can kind of do this sort of modeling. And this was a revelation to me. So let me explain what you're seeing before we do it. Here's the intrusion. So here's a body. It's about eight kilometers thick. It really doesn't matter how far it, uh, it extends that way. In 50 kilometer thick crust. And we put it in there. And again, apologies, we've lost the reds. But imagine it being red. And up here, it's gone in there at 1,200 degrees C. And we can actually you know, run this, I hope, and watch it actually cool. And with this, this program, it's called Heat 3D. You can actually do simple modeling in 3D. I hope I can get it to run. Yeah, there it goes. And what you see, actually, is something I think really cool. Is it's so big that it actually cools from the top downwards. The bottom doesn't cool. You see, the, you know, essentially, the colors are just moving downwards. So we're heating up the floor, and we're cooling the top. And so actually, you know, what you might intuitively think is the bottom cools too, the bottom is actually the last part of this thing to cool. It's so big, it basically cools from the top down to the bottom. And it actually fits 
remarkably well with the dating because the top is one million years um, older than the bottom. And at first glance, you think that's kind of a bit strange. It just means it took a million years for that thing to cool, and the top part cooled first. <coughs> okay. So the other thing I talked about is the intensity of the field. I can't remember the, the reds, but it doesn't really matter. So we've been doing these field measurements, different units, but let's use microteslas. Here's what we get out of the rocks, and here's the ancient field. You know, just by measuring the magnetization in those rocks, predicting what the field strength was in the Jurassic. And basically, you can read this graph, you know, somewhere in here between 10 and 20. Present field is 60 um, microteslas at the pole, 30 microteslas um, at the equator. So, you know, we found what we kind of predicted, which is that the field was much weaker at the time of the Dufek intrusion than it is in the present day. Fitting with this hypothesis that weak field equals rapid reversals. So what's the results of the magnetics? Well, we see a minimum of four polarity intervals in 500 meters. We saw that reverse, normal, reverse, um, and we saw the, the earlier normal before that. So we saw four polarity intervals. <coughs> if you extrapolate, and it's a pure extrapolation, remember the intrusion is something like eight kilometers thick, it suggests that it might be recording up to 50 reversals throughout the intrusion. Um, one of the ideas is to go back if NSF will fund us and you know, do the same sort of work through the rest of the intrusion. From those cooling models, we can suggest the whole intrusion cooled from 550 to about 350 in 5 to 10 million years. Um, we've seen this high reversal rate, and we've seen, just in that last slide, that the intensity of the field was pretty low, and in fact it's about a third of the present day. So, as a conclusion, as far as we can see, we're seeing something like five to ten reversals every million years, which is a lot, a lot more than two. Mm. To finish off, I just want to spend a little bit more time on the other aspect of the project, which is actually look at the petrology. I mean, back to this question, you've got the biggest guts of a volcano in the world. How does that work? Here's just another picture of the dufac. You can see the spin roofs up here. Here's some of the layering in there. And so really, my role is looking at the petrology, and the questions we're trying to ask is, how do you construct that thing? You know, again, if you go to the literature, there are people out there that just believe that that eight kilometers by hundreds of kilometers body of magma was just sitting there, you know, as a body of magma. But is that realistic? It's probably not. And if you had that big body of melt in the crust, things would fall into it. It just can't physically exist. So the most likely way that thing grew was bit by bit. You intruded one unit, then you intruded another unit, and so on and so forth. If that's the case, can we look at the rocks, look at the chemistry, look at anything we can look at to figure out how many replenishments there were, and if so, how big? Was that thing growing by intruding you know, 50 meters thick of magma? Was it growing by intruding 100 meters of magma, 500 meters of magma? Can we look at it and figure that out? Um, and if that's true, what's the time scale? We talked about time scales for cooling briefly, but what's the time scale for construction? You know, some people think replenishment equals eruption. So, you know, if we basically replenish frequently, and plus, quite possibly there was volcano on the top that was erupting just as frequently. One of the other big known, unknown questions in these things, or poorly understood is a better way to put it, is how do the crystals accumulate and form those rocks? We'll get some pre-purchases of rocks in a moment. And we can look at both the, the processes that are involved in the accumulation of the crystals and the subsequent processes that then affect the crystals once they're say, piled up on the bottom of the magma chamber. <coughs> and basically, you know, the only way to tackle this problem is to try everything. And this is one of the, this is kind of my area of research at Wyoming. Um, uh, as, as John <coughs> said, currently my biggest interest in is, is mid-ocean ridges and how we form oceanic crust. And it's the same sort of problem, but you're not going to solve it by just being a geochemist. And so, you know, we talk about magnetics, and we'll look at magnetics a little bit more in a minute. Geochemistry, petrography, electron backscatter scatter diffraction to look at the textures, to look at the crystallography. You know, the whole idea is to try and bring all this together. And then in the next few slides, I'm just going to show you a few of these things. First of all, a spectacular rock. This is this pyroxenite I, I mentioned. Here it is in the field called the Noodite pyroxenite. These light patches are single 
oikotris of inverted pigeon eye for the efficient R dose, so of, of pyroxy. Here's a little camera case for scale, so you can see these things are something like three inches across. And here's a thin section picture. And here's one oikotris, the next to another oikotris. Um, this whole rock is oikotris. You're just seeing the ones that are reflecting at you. There's oikotris, you know, they're just adjacent to each other, it's just these ones aren't shining at you. The cool thing about this, and it just blows my mind, is if you look at this carefully, you can see all the little dots that make up the big oikotris. I mean, the oikotris is centimeters, inches, and large, but it's made up of all these little tiny crystals. You see all the white little dots. So what happened there is you accumulated pigeon like crystals, which were maybe only a millimeter or two across. And as they cooled and inverted, they rearranged their crystal structure. If they were touching another crystal, they rearranged their crystal structure to grow into a single big crystal. And that just blows my mind how it did that. But that's what it did. I mentioned, this is just another one from the archives, you know, fundamentally, how do you build these things? And here are the four kind of classic models that we always try and, you know, um, piece out of this, of this problem. And so, sorry, I want to go back. You know, the issue is, what actually built this rock are all these tiny little crystals, not these weaker crystals. So we somehow we accumulated these millimeter scale pyroxenes. How did we do that? And if we look at this picture, here's some of the ideas. Classic ideas, you know, from, from some of the classic geology is simple crystal settling. In other words, remember from the cooling models, we had all the cooling at the top. So the crystals form at the top and then they settle and fall down to the bottom because they're more dense and then we get a layer of that pyroxene. The problem with this is nobody these days thinks this really works. That's the thing, it's falling down through the hot center of the, the macro body. These crystals are likely to remelt. Another idea is they just grew in situ. Some grew from the roof, some grew from the floor. Another idea is you get crystal laden plumes. You know, the, the, what this is trying to show you is that there's a cold melt around these crystals. The whole thing falls down to the bottom as a more dense packet brings the crystals to the floor. This avoids the problem of the melting crystals. Another idea is magmatic density currents, you know, gravity currents from the side of the magma chamber. You know, imagine like turbidity flows of crystals forming down the side of the magma chamber. These are the kind of questions that kind of face people studying these intrusions. And we still argue about it. Um, there's some people that would say a lot of that layering you see is purely chemistry. It's things like Lisa Gang rings. It's, diffusion competition effects. I'm a great a believer in the physical processes, which is why I showed you this picture. I think there were gravity currents with this intrusion. And in fact, you know, going back um, to that slide, to this thing, that remember I showed you earlier, the pyroxenite has a sharp base and then it grades upwards. This represents a big influx of a gravity current which was carrying all these pyroxene crystals and it dumped Um, and we don't really need to go into this, but it's just trying to illustrate how complicated this is. This is a flowchart of the possible formation mechanisms. The point is, this is what we pick up today. We pick this thing up, 100% solid. You know, it's been through all these different processes, and you know, research for poor graduate students is trying to figure your way through this flow diagram. You know, was it in situ crystallization? Did the crystals originally come from a density current? Were they from a crystal laden plume? Was it crystal settling? If we've done all these, do they then form a loose touching framework or a dense touching framework? Then does that framework compact under gravity or not? Then do you get overgrowth of those crystals or are you squashing them out? It's a different process and so on and so forth. And so, you know, the problem, and this is why it still exists and why igneous petrologists will be looking at this stuff for years to come, is you've got this and you're trying to back out your route through this picture. And that's why you need all those different methods. And, you know, just a taster, this is some of the chemistry. So here's our section again, here's some of our samples. Um, so here's stratigraphic height going up section. Here's the chemistry of the plagiar phase. So this is getting more mafic rich, if you like, more anathite rich. And you're seeing this change in chemistry as you go up here. Here's the chemistry of the pyroxenes. Um, two things just to point out, here's this thing, the Neuberg peroxenite. Notice the chemistry goes kind of crazy, you know, you've got these big jumps there. We think this is a replenishment event, this re represents a new magma coming in. The other thing to point out, it's just something that I don't understand, but it's one of the things I'm you know, just going to hang out there, is look how much the anorthoite changes over a certain distance. 
So here it is, something like about 84. By the time we get to 500 meters, it's down to about 60. So it's changing by about 24 over 500 meters. Now that's not going to mean a lot to a lot of people in the room, but the point is, is it's a rapid change. And it's something fundamentally different, and I don't understand why, but if we just look, and it's not the best picture in the world, here's three of the classic other lead intrusions. Scareguard in Greenland, still water, not far away from us, just into um, uh, Montana, and the Bushveld one, which is the biggest one in the world. But remember what I just said. The Dufac chemistry changed it by 20 a.m. in 500 meters. In Scareguard, it takes 2.5 kilometers to do the same. In still water, it takes greater than four kilometers of stratigraphic vertical section. In Bushveld, it takes something like 3.5 kilometers. So this, whatever we're seeing there, change in chemistry in Dufac is unlike any of the other big ones. Again, I don't know an answer for that. It's an observation. Um, coming back to the end now, just coming back to how you pull all this together, we're going back to magnetics. You can actually use the magnetics to measure the fabrics in the rock. If you measure on what's called AMS, anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility, it gives you an idea of the orientation of the crystals. And so again, here's our stratigraphic height, here's the azimuth, which direction it's pointing. If you kind of look at this picture, you can see basically there's a dense line of dots here and this dense line of dots there. Kind of makes sense because this is 360 degrees, so basically it's a straight line, you know, pointing in, in both directions. And what you can see is that there's a dominant, so this band is about 30 degrees, 180 degrees away from that is about 210 degrees. Um, and so basically this is the dominant orientation of the crystals in the intrusion, or at least over that 500 meters. So we know the crystals are kind of pointing in this direction. And what turns out is that that's parallel to the strike of the intrusion. Is that important? I'm not sure. Um, but the idea is it's telling you the flow direction. You know, to align those crystals, to give them that sort of orientation, the whole idea is it's trying to, we interpret that saying that's the direction the magma flowed. So again, coming back to this almost jigsaw puzzle we're working on, you're looking at these crumbs of information from different techniques to try and build this picture of how the whole thing works. So, coming to the end, just about on time. You know, the best thing about what we did is it really is a phenomenal data set. Um, I don't think there's anywhere in the world where, you know, pe people have done this density of sampling of oriented samples, which are there for anybody to use, not just us, to try and tease out these processes. So we've got something like 800 samples over something like 600 meters of samples. Those per peroxonites, which were associated with reversals, in mineral composition trends, we think are probably replenishments, represent a new magma coming in. And the distinct AMS, anisotropy, magnetic susceptibility, maxima, give us transport directions. And so, you know, we're really just starting, and we've still lots to do. I have a PhD student working on this now. Um, you know, it really is a massive project to try and build, bring all this together. And so, just to finish off, you know, here's beautiful sunset. You know, the sun never actually set. Coming back to the temperatures. Just to finish off to show you what it was like sometimes. <laughs> so we lost about three days. We were down there for about five weeks in total. But we did have one storm come through. And that just gave you a feeling for what it was like in the storm. basically a, a chainsaw, convert it to, for, for, with a drill on it. 
And so the diameter of the core is about yay big, about an inch and a half. And we'll only drill about you know, six inches. So that's, uh, so basically there's a single guy there with a chainsaw effectively poking this thing into the rock at all sorts of angles to try and confuse people. And then that's, so that's the sample. So they're all about six inches long. And then we cut them into one inch uh, mini cores. And then each one inch mini core is separately oriented. Right. Now, that will indicate a certain number of years. Well, the, the, again, the, the vertical extent of the intrusion is giving you the years. So, you know, one way or another is you go up or go down, and you don't really know that until you look at it, that's giving you age. Each little core hopefully gives you the same information. We cut it into six pieces to hope it's reproduced. <laughs> and then you have to very accurately measure the that you can drill. In. So as I mentioned, you can't use compass down there because yeah. so you actually use the same compass. So once that's drilled, you then put in basically a tube which goes into the hole, and then you've got a sun compass on top and you can orientate in that. Then it's back to the lab and it's into the wonderful world of magnetics, of which I'm not a an expert, and so on. fundamentally what people do though is they take those mini cores, they heat them up, and as they heat them up, they're backing out the magnetic history that they recorded. So you're, you know, our rock's tied at 1200 degrees C, or our liquid did. So it comes down, it's getting colder and colder, starts to record the magnetics of the curie temperature, but that will be mineral dependent. But actually, because these things are cooling slowly enough, they actually see the field flipping. And so back in the lab, you've got the rock which made it to zero degrees C. You carefully heat it up and measure the record of that fuel changing within the rock. And that's what you measure. So then you can get the temperature at which the fuel effect, if it did, recorded by that rock. And you sort of know the, the time period over which that core uh, cooled. You know, again, that's one thing you don't know to start with, but you can make the predictions. Okay. So, you know, in other words, you, you know, you're absolutely right. And you've driven rock, we can see that three reversals. Then the next question is, how long? And so then you've got to have another independent piece of information that gives you some sort of. You mentioned a million years to cool. Yeah. From what's come to the heat. Oh, so the thing? Did everybody hear the question? No. 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 So I'll repeat the question. Um, so the question is, I actually mentioned two cooling time scales, but the first part of the cooling is a million years long. Where did the heat come from? Well, this, this stuff, this magma, is coming from melting the mantle. So there is some thermal anomaly in the mantle, which might well be to do to that rifting as we pull across the part, we let the hot mantle comes up, and as that hot mantle comes up, it basically adiabatically decompresses and starts to melt. And so when we get to our intrusion, that stuff coming into the intrusion is 1200 degrees C plus or minus. So that big, you know, that eight kilometer thick watch of layers was intruded as a liquid at about 1200 degrees C. And then it slowly melts. I think Jeff and Brett was first, but so if you're in your uh, AMS calculations, did you have to correct for continental drift? Yeah, so, you know, it's a good question. I mean, I, you know, it's kind of things that, um, you know, I kind of gloss over. Um, there's two parts of that question. Um, basically, you know, I showed you that picture of the lava flow. So, you know, in present day, lava flow comes out into this room. It records the direction of the field today. But we all know the continents move. I showed you the pictures of the moving, you know, splitting apart of Antarctica and so on and so forth. And so we always have to do various corrections to correct out those effects. And, and another you know, corollary to that is the rocks might have been tilted. You know, and if the rocks have been tilted, then the direction of the field is not what it was to start with. And so paleomagicians do what's called a fold test. You know, and the fold test is to look for folds and try and unfold it to get back to that. Now, again, it depends what you want. In terms of the AMS, all I'm interested in is what's the orientation of those crystals. I don't really care, except within the context of what's the orientation of the intrusion. But in terms of the, the question of what's the orientation of the field, yeah, we have to correct this. Sorry. Early, you, well, two questions. First, you had a chart showing magnetic field versus time, yeah. with large, large changes or large variations. Yeah. Okay. The scale was zero to about 
Yeah, so um, this I mean, so Peter's question was length of time. I'm going wrong way. Uh, um, again, it's back to, I can find it, this picture. Sorry. I know you're in talk, you know where your signs are. John's going to say, you can go to this. Let's just do that. Oops. <laughs> I guess my gut feeling is 
you know, the, the plates of this 200 kilometers on the top and around figure. The, what's really going on with all this stuff is the stuff at the bottom is at the core. So, you know, something like a couple of thousand kilometers away. So I'm not sure. Um, but I don't know. I don't think Especially that period of time where nothing was going on. Right, yeah. I mean, you know, it comes back to the thing I was saying earlier over there. What people have played the game, you know, is you could plot on this graph magmatic activity in terms of hotspots. And so, lo and behold, in the Cretaceous, it's a good time. If you look at the oceans, you have these big ocean plateaus, and we think that those are vast eruptions of magma. And so, there is the correlation that not so much where the continents are, but is it something to do with the amount of melting coming out of the Earth? And it comes back to that thing of, you know, people talk about plumes, mountain plumes possibly being sourced from the core mantle boundary. You know, what happens if we have, you know, so we've got the, the core down there, and then basically a convective instability comes off the top of the core or the boundary around the core and comes up through the mantle. What kind of thing that happens? When you've done that, you're pulling material and heat from it. Is that something that then affects what's happening in the geodynamo, which then affects the food and so on? People have done a lot of speculation on that. Now, it kind of comes back to that very early picture I showed you, that you know, the, the correlation of, of, of thermal anomalies on the core boundary with the strength of the magnetic field. People have made that suggestion. Yeah, I'm confused about the, the size of the magnetic field. I've only a hundred of the current uh, Yeah, um, again, forgive me. Um, uh, one of the things that, you know, that people do when talking about the reversals is how much is it moving from the ambient. And so it really is just giving you a quantification of how much it's changing. So it's not, you know, again, I mean, forgive me, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but, you know, when talking about um, the reversals, what you're kind of interested in is, is how much is it flipping from what is, I mean, we can predict what the strength of the field should be of the Earth, and as you know, the field is stronger at the poles than it is at the other way around. The other way around. No, I'm right. Stronger at the poles than it is at the equator. That's how much from that, you know, imagine an ideal Earth, what it should be. That's the excess above that ideal Earth. And that's what paleomagicians tend to do to demonstrate what the field That's what it is. Oh, Mike. Here's the high frequency of field reversal in the past 40 million years. Yeah. If you sort of compare the time, you know, the flip flop is right. crazy. Yeah. What do the paleomagicians <laughs> say about you say, I say that. <laughs> when the next reversed field hits, and what should we look for? Um, I, you know, I think the, the truth is, it, could happen any time. And, you know, Bobby just made this point. Look at the graph, and you can see how it's flipping. And we just can't resolve it. And that is, you know, what stimulated a lot of this research and stimulated things like the the Hollywood movies is like latching onto that kind of idea. Um, you know, what would you know? What do I think I might look for? You know, as you kind of hinted, is declining field strength. That's something you could easily measure if you start to notice the field is getting a little bit weaker then you might want to start to get worried. So I think that's that's the first thing you look for. You know, what would be the, the, the let's say, physical effects on Earth? Um, I you know, everybody probably didn't hear that. Okay, so Bob asks, what would be the physical effects on Earth? With a reversal. Right. Um, so, and by that, I mean on the Earth, probably not a lot. But, but you mean on life on the Earth? Like on life on Earth. Exactly. <laughs> I was just trying to dodge. I was just trying to dodge that question. That was all that was. It's very um, self-centered. You know, I think you know it's safe to say that the, you know the core is just you know is 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 completely wrong. I mean, you know, don't worry about it. But people do worry. You know, it's hard to predict exactly you know how good it will be, and I'll put it that way. In other words, you know. I think the worst that's going to happen to us is we might have to wear some more sunscreen. I mean, you know, it's quite likely we will see the aurora borealis, you know, depending on where the field is going, you know, on any part of the planet. Um, you know, sunspots are going to have a bigger impact. I mean, you know, if you think about it, actually, there's pictures of the South Pole. People live at the South Pole under, if you like, a hole in the Earth magnetic field. All the great solar rays coming down there, you know, they survive. Um, 
So the atmosphere is the thing that really is going to protect us. So things like communications might go to pot in the sense that, you know, our satellites, and, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, but I think, you know, basically we won't barely even notice. I mean, the other kind of curious thing, and again, getting way beyond anything I know about, I'm not sure I know much about this, but you know, um, things like birds, animals. I mean, how many people, how many, how, you know, how true is it that birds and things use the magnetic field to navigate? Because we're certainly going to mess up you know, the moment. You know, compasses are not going to work very well. <laughs> <laughs> Was the data that uh, created this come from all over the world? Yeah. Mostly from the sea floor. That's one of the first places these so-called strikes were found. Because, you know, it's kind of, you know, sea floor, you don't suffer so much from the, you know, things being folded or moved out of the way. So, you know, you, know, you pick up a basalt from the sea floor, you can pretty much measure what's the orientation. And so, you know, we first recognized the stripes in the early 60s. And that was one of the ideas that, you know, that explained plate tectonics, because then it became how do you get these stripes? And the idea is conveyor belt. So the melt comes up in the middle, it freezes, it traps in whatever the field is, and we pull the plates about a little bit more. If the field is um, reversed in that time, we get a different orientation. So, you know, and that's why this thing stops at that here, because oceanic crust, you know, there isn't much oceanic crust all the time. Yes, it's one of the But that's where most of it comes from. How is it proven that the core is made out of a core of metal with, uh, I think you said iron and nickel going around it? Yeah. So, again, I'm not an expert on this, but two pieces of evidence. Um, you know, one, we can do geophysics. So, we can make predictions about density um, from things like gravity and whatnot. So, we can make an estimate of how dense that thing is down there. Um, um, the other thing, which is a nice piece of information, is meteorites. In that, you know, some meteorites are iron meteorites, and what they are is little pieces of the core of a planet that never quite perhaps fall, and so on and so forth. So it's actually putting together meteoritic information and geophysical information, trying to predict what's down there for measurements. And then people will start doing measurements in the lab. You know, they'll try and recreate those conditions with with the materials we might think down there and try and mimic I, I know this is reaching, but given the, the remarkable climate stability of the Cretaceous, yeah. could there be any relationship between polar stability and atmosphere? I honestly don't know. I mean, I honestly don't know. I mean, great question, um, but I honestly don't know. No, I mean too far away. But I mean the cool thing is, you know, looking at places like the inner star, I mean, one side the other. So you know we can play the games that um, you know we can use other planets if you like to look at the future of the Earth. Because you know eventually, you know, on a, a massive time scale, the Earth is going to cool down as it cools down, starts to freeze, and then there'll be no magnetic field. I mean, it's, the magnetic field is because of the liquid outer core. We freeze the outer core, and then there's no magnetic field. That's the kind of thing we play with planetary games. So other things, if you write for NASA for money, you say, well, I need to go and look at this because it predicts the future of what's going to happen on the Earth, and it's really important. We'll give you some money. In the core, you have iron and nickel yeah. melted. Yeah. But you also have it um, solid. Yeah. Why doesn't it melt? Uh, pressure. Pressure. And so, you know. Oh, oh so the center part is the high pressure. Exactly. So it's pressure and temperature. We had two views on hot spots, oh, like right. Hawaii and Yellowstone, yes. yeah. mm -hmm. and or maybe mm -hmm. that theory doesn't work at all. Does your experience with what's in the South um, and in Antarctica give you a, a view of one side or the other? Uh, the question was about the hot spots and what you know what we've kind of been working on. Simple answer is, I don't think it does, but it's not going to stop me from making some comments. <laughs> um, I mean, to flesh that out a little bit, I think what you kind of ask me, and maybe somebody's come up here and talk, I mean, Bob Smith, for example, um, you know, there's this big debate of all of these things called mantle plumes or not. And, you know, again, it shows you what the field is really like. You know, there's some really smart people, a lot smarter than I, who argue ferociously over whether mantle plumes exist or not. 
And, and what the mantle plume idea is, is that you know, the core is hot, it's cooling, and so it loses that heat by having big convective cells come from the core mantle boundary that come rising up and then hit the bottom of the crust, and that's why we have Yellowstone, that's why we have Hawaii. And that's you know, a classic plate tectonic theory. Um, there's some very eminent people that come around and say, no, that's absolutely rubbish. Um, you know, what it really is, it's all surface effects. You get a crack in the outer shell, and the crack in the outer shell lets hotter stuff come up, and so on and so forth. I guess I'm a mantle plume guy. Um, <laughs> um, you know, in a way, the, you know, it's, a, it's been a really interesting argument in terms of looking at how science works. Because the non mantle plume guys go, well, your simple model from the 60s doesn't fit. And it's like, so what? You know, we know it was a simple model from the 60s. But that's how the you know argument is really I mean I guess you know the argument is broken down into, you know, well your simple model doesn't work. And and you know everybody would say the simple model doesn't work, but that doesn't mean to say it's still an essence. We're, we're gonna sick uh, Julian Porter. Right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned no names. Um, <laughs> she, she and Bob Smith. Your right, no, I saw from the, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a plumber. Well, I hit you with one more, one more question. I'm trying to think about um, how we get perturbations to the core, which will then uh, make it, make it unstable and flip. What, I don't know my timetables on large meteor impacts on the Earth. Is there any large meteor impacts within these periods of time? Any, any correlation? Um, 65. 65 yeah. is that? Yeah. yeah. So you can look at 65. Says, you know, the, the Cretaceous boundary here is effectively defined by the, the, the Yucatan impact. Yeah. That, that, that was my question exactly, John. Uh, I uh, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> but uh, it just causes me to wonder you have all this stability all the stability, a major meteorite impact crater. And granted, it's a, a pimple on the skin, but does it set up enough earth waves and what have you to begin to cause some perturbations at the core? But it started seven million years, or seven million years before that. Yeah, I know. Well, it's just a measurement. <laughs> 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 Excellent. Well, thank you so much.